So the first outages associated with the incidents um, actually occurred in June of 2017. In this instance, uh, one ESD controller was impacted. Again, the ESD, uh, the DCS systems, didn't reflect the unsafe condition. Um, so at this stage, the engineers were considering it as a, um, a potentially malfunctioning ESD controller. They did engage the vendor, um, Schneider Electric, to come on site and investigate um, the controller. So they pulled a number of logs from the systems, the diagnostics information, um, to look at what was going on with the controller. Um, of note, they actually removed the controller for analysis, took it back to their lab, um, and did a mechanical check on the actual device. So the scope of the initial um, outage investigation that occurred in June um, was insufficient. Uh, realistically, this is a missed opportunity to identify the attackers um, and prevent the subsequent outage in August. Uh, the initial investigation only included the, uh, an engineering and mechanical analysis of the ESD controllers. Uh, it really should have included a, a subsequent cybersecurity investigation into what occurred within the plant. The next outage that occurred is um, what's more publicly known out in the industry. Um, the second outage occurred in early August, I think it was the 4th of August. Again, this time occurring on a, uh, a weekend evening. So this time it was a Friday evening. Uh, in this instance, there are actually multiple controllers that are impacted across multiple phases of the process um, and the plant. Um, I believe there was actually about six controllers that went down in this incident um, across some significantly uh, complex and uh, sensitive areas, including the sulfur recovery units and the burner management systems. Um, so the worst case scenario here, you're dealing with a potential release of toxic hydrogen sulfide gases um, and potential for um, you know, explosions from high pressure, high temperature, toxic materials. So the initial findings from this uh, investigation, so again, we were pretty lucky because we had a, a pretty de def uh, definitive timeline to work from. So the initial outages from the ESD systems. Um, going from that outage and pulling the logs from the ESD systems, we were able to see um, a number of safety alarms that started triggering at approximately 7.43 p.m. on August 4th. Uh, looking from here in the, the event timeline, we were able to see a number of Windows events and uh, file creations that occurred on the engineering system. Um, this included the, uh, the Python uh, executables, the Nanos, Triton, Trilog, um, that kind of stuff. We also identified there are a number of programs that were running in the impacted controller's memory. So all six controllers had something running in there that we were able to identify what it was at the time. The operators were actually seeing the um, alarms, the safety alarms from these controllers. Um, there were alarms popping up on the screen saying uh, ESD controller in program mode. However, I was told at the time that this wasn't a big problem because these alarms only need to be acknowledged once per day. Um, at this point in time, we'd identified, as I say, we had pulled the actual logs. Um, we did actually get quite lucky in this instance um, the, as one of the engineering systems that we did image um, contained the Trilog uh, executables. Um, where, how we got lucky was um, basically, it seems that the attackers got somewhat complacent as they'd been in the environment for quite a long time and had left the tools on that system and up until the point that we imaged it. Um, we did get very lucky because when we went back later to verify, um, once we'd found the files, um, they'd been deleted and wiped by the attackers. So the, the plan itself had um, relatively, on paper, had a, quite a secure architecture. Um, they had the ISO 95 layout, the different zones and conduits, um, a properly deployed um, security infrastructure to segregate IT and OT environments. Um, however, what we found during the review is the configuration of the, the DMZ firewalls um, was relatively insecure. So what had happened is that actually uh, enabled the attacker to pivot from the IT network into the DMZ quite easily, um, and then from the, the DMZ into the plant network. And then you talk about the engineering systems that were connected to the plant network um, allowed full access. I have this point in here, but I'm not going to go into too much detail, but beyond the scope of um, Triton and Trisis, there were other incidences that were identified. Um, so we had to kind of sift through um, the different malware that was identified in the organization. Some of it had been there for quite some time, um, dating back many years. On the IT network, there was a number of events of um, Mimikatz being executed that was actually caught by the antivirus systems. Um, however, the alerts and events weren't going through to a, um, a centralized SOC. So while they were being caught, um, nobody's responding to these and following it up. So again, missed opportunity to catch this in the IT network, potentially without them being able to get into the OT network. Um, while they were lucky, it wasn't a catastrophic incident and loss of the plant, um, it was still very expensive. So we're talking about multiple outages. 
Each of these outages required the plant to be down for at least a week. Um, you're also looking at the, the loss of um, production, the loss of um, product that had to get flushed through the, um, uh, the plants uh, during the recovery process. You're also talking about extremely expensive uh, uh, investigations through third-party vendors and the, the containment recovery uh, activities.